as we continue to do a verse-by-verse -verse study of the Word of God. And uh, I trust that as we walk through here and walk through the pages of Scripture, Jeffrey's already prayed it, and boy, if we would just do it. Um, how many of us realize there's di a difference between reading the book Reset and resetting? Um, when... The children of Israel, in the time of Ezra, saw something in the Word of God that they do not, were not doing. They immediately obeyed. They didn't even think about it. They immediately obeyed. The question becomes how often that happens in our life. Do you and I come to the Word of God for the purpose of resetting? And boy, we should every Sunday. Every Monday, every Tuesday, every Wednesday, every Thursday, every time we open the book, we ought to be reminding ourselves of, number one, what we're reading is God's word. Number two, God owns me, 1 Corinthians 6.19. And therefore, if I read something in the book that I'm not doing, I need to do it. I need to do it. Uh, again, I'm reminded of Psalm 1. It says blessed. And, and it's interesting. The Hebrew word has more information in it than just what we think in the English. But part of that is happy. If I'm blessed, I'm happy. If I really see the blessings of God in my life, I'm happy. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of the sinner, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight... Is in the law of the Lord. How many of us delight when we get to read Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy? His delight is in the law of the Lord. And in this law doth he meditate day and night. And he'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth fruit in its season. His leaves never wither whatsoever he does, he prospers. Boy, I want that life. Guess what? It's here. It's here, but it's in resetting according to the word of God. Two weeks ago, we looked at the fact that Jesus taught the disciples a parable, and he said the kingdom of heaven is like, and, and the whole parable was all about this. God is never unjust in what he does. He has the right to do with your life and my life what he wants to do with your life and my life. He has that right. And it's interesting, as we start through this passage, starting at verse 17, he is going to give us the greatest example of that truth in that Jesus is going to live what he just said. He's going to live what he just said. He's not just going to say, God has a right to my life. He's going to demonstrate, God has a right to my life. He's already said it in John 5 when he said, I have come to do the will of the Father. Do you realize that the whole life of Jesus, his mindset was, I'm not here for happiness. I'm not here for comfort. I'm not here for big houses. I'm not here for plaudits. I'm not here for recognition. I'm not here for me. I'm here to do the will of the Father. How different would your life and my life, how different would the outlook of your life and my life be if we just simply reminded ourselves every day, this thing called life is not about me. This thing called life is about the glory of God. And I'm here for God's will. The, the interesting part about that is, keep your finger here in Matthew 20. We're going to get started here in a minute. But I want you to look at John 14. John 14 for a minute. And, and Jesus is promising the Holy Spirit in John 14. The Holy Spirit had not come and descended upon people in the Old Testament like he did the New Testament. In the New Testament, he indwells. Since the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit indwells your life. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's where he resides 
We studied this last Sunday night, or two Sunday nights ago, when we were looking at the names of God. Do you realize that where two or three are gathered, God is here because he indwells the church? I want to ask you a question. Do you know someone that can't stand the church? The dwelling place of God? This is where God gets glory. Unlike no other, this is where God should get glory. You know when that'll be true? That'll be true when we live for God's glory. When we live for God's glory. How many of you know that God sometimes will test you on things you say? God is testing me on things I say right now. And Mary said, you're going to blurt this out in a sermon. And I'm going to say, and I said, no, I won't, but I'm going to. Okay, Mary Lou? Uh, had a physical done in December. Uh, in that physical, there was some lab tests done. The lab tests demonstrated the fact that there may be an issue. Uh, the, final, the family doctor said, you need to go see a specialist. I went to the specialist. He did an exam. He said, you probably have an issue. Um, I'm going February 9th, which is Beck, uh, Mary's birthday, for a biopsy that we expect to probably be positive. Uh, I, I don't see any other way around it, uh, looking at what I'm looking at. And God is good. Amen? Because Deuteronomy 32 says God always does right. And he has the right to my life. By the way, pray for my kids. Because they're the ones that probably are going to struggle more than anybody uh, when we go through this. Uh, but they all need to realize that daddy knows that God is good. So please do me a favor. Don't pray that the biopsy is negative. And don't pray for healing if the biopsy is positive. Pray that God gets glory in the way we handle this. Because this life belongs to God. Amen? Look at this, if you would. Jesus says in John 14, If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Jesus said, when Pentecost comes, the Holy Spirit's going to come. And he's going to indwell you. And by the way, the fruit of the Spirit is... Love and joy and peace in the midst of a biopsy, in the midst of a trial, peace. God says that will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. And, and, and faith and temperance, and self-control, and he goes on and on, and he talks about the wonderful things that the Spirit gives us, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. Listen, you're an incredible benefit, uh, believer. The, the world cannot have what you have. The world cannot have peace in the midst of the storm like you've got. The world cannot have faith when there makes no sense to live by faith. But you can. Why? Because you know God. And you trust in the true and the living God. Now keep going down because in verse 25 it says, no, verse 23 says, if a man love me, he, what's the next word? He will. Now, now pay attention to that, guys. It's in the scriptures. That means it's inspired. That means it's of God. The word will is there because God wanted it to be there. And he says this in verse 23, If a man love me, if a man love me, he will. Will do what? Wow. i got to think about my gospel and my conversion based on this verse. Because man, it's so easy to say I love God. And God says, listen, I don't care what you say. I'm going to look at your life to see if you do. That's what he's saying here. This is very objective truth. And very objective truth is this. If you love God, you will obey him. 
Now listen, we don't obey him to get to heaven, amen? But if we're a new creation, old things pass away and all things become new. If I'm comfortable disobeying God, I got a problem with my love for God. You know what the problem is? I love me more than I love God. Isn't, are we being fair to the text? Isn't it what it says? Keep going. He says, if a man love me, he will keep my words and my father will love him and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. We'll make our abode with him. Boy, there is nothing better than to lay your head on the pillow at night and to wake up in the morning and recognize the fact that God is with me. And when I go to get the biopsy, God is with me. And when I get the results of the biopsy, God is with me. And when I get to the point where my life is ending, God is with me. Why? Because precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of a saint. Why? Jesus says, I pray that they be with me. Wow, what a perspective on life, amen? But what a perspective on whether or not I really truly love God. Because the Word of God says if I love Him, I'll, I'll obey Him. Keep reading. He says in verse 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again and, uh, uh, unto you. If you love me, you would rejoice because I said I go unto my father, for my father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it came to pass that when, uh, when it is come to pass, you might believe. Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. But, listen, that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father giveth me commandments, even so I do. Do you hear what Jesus is saying? Jesus is saying this, I want the world to know that I love the Father, and so therefore I am going to be obedient to the Father. We live in a world where if we're really comfortable with being honest, totally honest, we would have to say that the testimony of the church is anything but anemic. And I want to tell you why it's anemic. I don't have to guess. God tells us. You know how the world will know that you're in love with God? When you obey God. When your life is about glorifying Him and not about glory, doing you a favor. When your life is about saying, you know what, I'm God's to control. I'm going to do what God wants me to do. We were in the, the store the other day. We're back in Matthew. We were in the store the other day. And I was checking out. I was minding my own business and, and checking out. And you, you guys all know how focused I can get. And that's a very negative thing. And I apologize. But I get focused when I'm doing something. And so I'm focused on bags. And I hear someone say, you're the preacher, aren't you? And I looked up and I'm like, who is this guy? Must have met him at a funeral somewhere. And the next question he said, are you saved? And this was in the middle of Walmart. And I said, yes, I'm saved. And I said, the scriptures teach us how we can know that we have eternal life. And he said, you know, there's a lot of preachers out there that aren't. And I thought, hmm. Hmm. A lot of people who profess Christ who are living any way but obedient to God. Jesus says, how can you say you love God and not keep his commandments? 
Well, we're going to see in this passage of Scripture an incredible example of that. Starting in verse 17, it says, And Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples apart in the way, and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him. And the third day he shall rise again. And you need to understand something. Jesus, when he was getting ready to go to Jerusalem this time, it was different. This was his last trip. And he was going, and he knew what was going to happen. And he set his face towards Jerusalem, and he went. And by the way, he set his face towards Jerusalem in order that the scriptures would be fulfilled to fulfill prophetic scripture. The word of God teaches us in verse 17 that he went up to Jerusalem. It wasn't an easy task. I'm not going to put a whole lot on this. But when he first started, he was about a thousand feet below sea level, close to Jericho, down at the Dead Sea. And he's going to go up to Jerusalem. And if you've ever seen it, it sits on a hill. Now, it's a hill. It's not a mountain. If you're from Montana, it's not even a hill. It's 2,500 feet above sea level. So it's not really high, but it sits up from where he was. And he's going to go up to Jerusalem. And, and, and it's interesting, when, when he's going, as he's going up, he took the 12 disciples apart in the way. Now, why did he do that? Well, this is Passover time. The roads are just absolutely inundated with people. And so they're with a whole bunch of other people, and Jesus knows that he's got something to say to these 12, so he takes them and he pulls them aside. It's interesting to me when Jesus reveals Scripture to people, he doesn't always do it at the same time and in the same way. Our spiritual growth is a progressive growth. That tells us that we need to be very careful with people who aren't where we are sometimes. Or maybe we're not where we think we are sometimes. But here's the 12. They've been with him the whole time, and Jesus is setting his eyes towards. It says in, Matthew, or in Luke 18, just listen to these words. In Luke 18, it says, Then he took unto him the 12 and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. Jesus says, We're going up. By the way, who were these guys? Studiers of the word. You know, if they would have studied the prophets closely, they would not have been surprised at all at what's about to happen. You realize that if they read Isaiah and they read Ezekiel and they read Zechariah and they read the Psalms, they would have every bit of an understanding of exactly why Jesus is going to Jerusalem. And they didn't. They did not understand. They studied. But they studied with some preconceived ideas. Jesus is going to come. The Messiah is going to come. He's going to set up a kingdom. Everything is going to go away. Rome's going to go away. Everything's going to be hunky-dory. It's interesting Jesus says in the very next verse, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem. So he tells them. But then he says this, and by the way, he starts it with behold. Pay attention. This is important. We're going to Jerusalem. Now that's not a surprise to them. Exodus 32, all males had to go to Jerusalem three times a year. He's going up for the Passover. The difference is Jesus isn't going up to fulfill the, the Passover under the law. Jesus is going to become the Passover lamb. Jesus is not, not going up to slay a lamb. He's going up to be the lamb. There's a big difference. By the way, this isn't the first time Jesus told them. I want you to see that. Look at uh, Matthew 16. Just go back to 16. And look at his words in verse 21, where he says, From that time forth, Matthew 16, 21, From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must needs go to Jerusalem. You know what he's saying? This is non-negotiable, guys. 
I've got to go. This is non-negotiable. I've got to go. I'm going to Jerusalem, and I'm going to Jerusalem, and I'm going to suffer. This is non-negotiable, guys. I've got to go. I've got to suffer. I've got to, by the way, Jesus has told us something similar, to hasn't he? Yea, they that live godly will suffer. You mean life's supposed to be tough? You mean uh, the gospel that is preached in today's world, you come to Jesus and everything will be hunky? But let me ask you a question. How many of us live for the hunky life? I've had people say to me, this can't be of God because God would never allow this in my life. Have you read the Old Testament? Do you realize 11 out of 12 of the original disciples were martyred? Only one historically was said to die of old age, and it was John on the Isle of Patmos. And God is in sovereign control. That's why he says in John 16, verse 24, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow. Listen, until we're ready to die to self, we're not ready to live for God. Until I'm ready to say my life no longer matters. What matters here is the glory of God. You say that's foolishness. Well, then you can't be a believer. Because that's what Jesus demands. And if I love God, that commandment won't be grievous. 1 John chapter 5. If I love God, giving up my life will not be the important thing. He says, we're going up to Jerusalem. Look at chapter 17 and verse 22. In case they didn't get it where he said he must... In chapter 17, in verse 22, Jesus says to them, Jesus said, the Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of the man. He says, okay, we're going up. He said it had to take in, it ha had to happen. He says, it's, it's impending, the trip is coming near, and now he's saying to them, we're going. We're going. This wasn't the first time that Jesus told them what was going on, but they're not getting it. I want you to listen to one more verse. Listen to this. This is out of the book of Mark, chapter 10 and verse 32 for note takers. It says, and they were in the way going up to Jerusalem and Jesus went before them. Do you get the picture? He's going to Jerusalem. Why is he going? To suffer, to die, to be spit upon, to be ridiculed. And as the gang takes off for Jerusalem, guess who's in the lead? He's not coming up in the back going, oh boy, oh me, oh my. Why? Because God's in sovereign control. And we're going to see that based on these circumstances. Jesus went before them and they were amazed. The word amazed literally means they were stupefied. They see him going, He's like, come on, guys, let's go. And they're looking at him like, what are you in a hurry for? And not only that, they were afraid. We talked about this two weeks ago, folks. But I would submit to you that one of the greatest lessons you and I need to learn is that our feelings are not based on intellect. Our feelings many times are based on whether or not we have faith or we don't have faith. 
I want to take you back to a story we studied not too long ago. Peter. He's in a boat in a storm. And he sees Jesus walking on the water and he says what? Bid me. Now, wait a minute. There's a storm, Peter. I don't know about you, but if you ever got caught in a storm in an aluminum boat on the middle of a lake, you would do what? Let's head for shore! <laughs> Peter says, bid me come to you. Jesus says, sure. I want to ask you a question. How could he have gotten out of the boat? Because his eyes was on the Savior. But he gets out and he begins to sink. And he says, help me! And Jesus responds with these words. O oh, thou of little faith. Friends, he was within an arm's reach of the Savior. And he was fearful of the storm? Let me ask you a question. How close are you to your Savior in the middle of a storm? He lives inside of me. He says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. My body is his temple. No matter what I go, when I go to the specialist and the specialist says to me, and this was perfect timing as far as I'm concerned for this sermon. When I went to that specialist and he did the test and he said, you know what? He said, uh, this is a really questionable thing. And he said, based on the lab and, and based on what's going on, he says, I think we're dealing probably with something that we need to biopsy. Now, I could do one of two things. I could fall apart, or I could say, I know who holds the future, and I know who holds my hand. And you know what Scripture teaches me? It's appointed unto men once to die, and after that, the judgment. And when my appointment day comes, I'm out of here, no matter what doctor I have. But by the way, it, doesn't, it is not affected by the, the outcome of the biopsy. Because God's in control. Amen? And when I go home, I'll go home just like Dorothy, resting, knowing where my presence will be when I die. Right? Why? Because he's in control. You know, we can either respond in faith or we respond in fear. The disciples responded in fear. And we need to always understand that feelings and emotions are dangerous when they are not brought captive to the truth of God's Word. Scripture teaches us, cast down imaginations and everything that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bring captive every thought to the obedience of Christ. Hebrews 12 says it this way, uh, we are to run the race that is set before us, but how? Fixing our eyes on the author and the finisher of our faith. And it goes on to say that, that Jesus won the victory who, who looked forward to the joy that was set before him. Can you imagine going to Jerusalem saying, I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. And he was able to do it because he knew he was going to fulfill the will of God. And he didn't skip a beat because he knew he was fulfilling the will of God. Right? Are we being fair? And Jesus gives the details to the disciples and he says this, the Son of Man shall be betrayed. The Son of Man is a Messianic title. And he says he's going to be betrayed. By the way, what happened in chapter 26 and verse 15? Judas, his friend, betrayed him with a kiss. Jesus said, I'm going and I'm going to be betrayed. 
Not only that, I'm going to be betrayed under the chief priests and the scribes. You know who he was betrayed to? The religious elite. Let's say it this way, the educated. The doctors of the law. Who read the scriptures and missed it. Because they didn't see a suffering Messiah. Are you kidding me? Let's read Isaiah 53. Let's read Psalm 22. Let's look at the multiple pictures of, uh, of the suffering Messiah in Scripture. But here's the point I want you to see. Exactly the way Scripture said it. Look at chapter 26 and verse 57. And we won't do this with all of them. You'll have to do it later. But look at verse 57. Of, of Matthew 26, it says this, And they uh, that had laid hold on Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, uh, with the scribes and the elders were assembled. So there they are. By the way, Peter follows them, and he follows them. Uh, he's what you call a secret agent. He's going to betray Jesus himself. He's going to deny Jesus because he's fearful of what's going to happen. And the Jewish leaders deliver him then to a trial of condemnation to death. By the way, it was an unjust judge. You know how you know that? Because Pilate listened to, the te listened to all the... Uh, the, the all the um, accusations against him, and he says, I find no fault. They had nothing on Jesus. But I want you to understand something. As a Christian, Jesus did not protest. He did not stand up and you know what he did? He committed himself to his father. And it was an unjust situation. And, and, and the word of God goes on to say in this passage, and they shall condemn him to what? To death. Here's these unjust judges, and what are they going to do? They're going to condemn him to death. Look at chapter uh, uh, 27. Chapter 27, in verse 1, where it says this, When the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to what? To put him to death. Folks, Jesus knew that. Jesus knew that, and he did it anyway. Why? Because he knew it was God's will and God's plan. Jesus was the only human being that never needed a reset. Because his eyes were always on doing and fulfilling the will of the Father. They would condemn him to death and it's fulfilled in chapter 27 verse 2. By the way, the Jews had no right to put him to death. So you know what they did? They took him to the Gentile. What does scripture say? They delivered him, verse 19, to the Gentiles. To the Gentiles. He was tried before Pilate. And again, if you read verses 18, 19, 20, 21, 20, you know that Pilate knew that he was innocent. And Jesus said, I'm fulfilling the will of the Father. This isn't right. Remember what Jesus has just taught on with the parable? Whether or not God is just or unjust. Whether or not God has a right to do what he wants to do with his own. And Jesus is giving us an incredible example of this. This is how you die to self. And take up your cross and follow. You obey God even when it's not right. Boy, does the world need that message today. If we're not careful, 
the, the, the rhetoric of the world will creep into this church and we will not be thinking scripturally. They'll deliver him to the Gentiles. And he'll be mocked and he'll be scourged. He'll be mocked and he'll be scourged. What happened? They put him on a cross. They mocked him. They spit upon him, Mark said. Then when he gets to the cross, they say, hey, if you are who you say you are, just come down and save us. And they mock him. But I want to ask you a question, why? They're fulfilling scripture and they don't know it. You know, there wasn't anybody at the crucifixion saying, okay, let me read you the text and then you guys do what I'm telling you to do because we need to fulfill the will of God. No, they're just living their life. And God the Father already knows everything that's going to happen. You know, that's why the scriptures say, don't fear those who can destroy your body. Fear him who can destroy both body and soul. We've only got one person to fear in our life, and now it ought to be a holy, reverential fear of God. And my friend, if we understand what Scripture says, we should be concerned every time we purposefully disobey a holy God. Because you know what he promises? To spank and to scourge those who are called his children. Now, J. Vernon McGee made a statement one time, just because God hasn't taken you to the woodshed yet doesn't mean you got away with it. You may have experienced God's grace and God's mercy up until this point, but at some point in time, God will take care of your disobedience if you're his. Is salvation by grace alone through faith alone in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary alone, and all God's people said what? Amen. Amen. But that does not divorce us from disobedience, from obedience. Because God cares. And not only that, verse 19 goes on to say, and they will crucify him. Did Jesus have to die a death of crucifixion? Yes. Why? Because God's plan, ordained of God, penned by the prophets, said he would hang on a tree. And that crucifixion was absolutely necessary. And boy, what a story, right? Now wait, the verse isn't done. But on the third day, he'll arise. On the third day, he'll arise. You know, the whole time through this, he could have cried, Foul! Unfair! Unjust! This isn't right! And we sing it all the time. He could have called. 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set them free. By the way, he didn't need 10,000 angels. He could have just come down off the cross. He's God, you know. But he died alone. Why? For you and for me. And he kept his eyes fixed on what he was here to do. And folks, when God asks us to die to self, generally it isn't for us. It's for others who need to see us dead to self. Folks, I want to tell you what, and I've already told Mary this, whatever happens with this test, and it could be negative, but it indicates that it's probably positive, or we, all, we think, we think, my kids need to see a father who has faith. And a true and a living God who is in sovereign control of all of life's circumstances, and I will not back down. Do your kids and my kids see that? 
Or do we fall apart every time something happens? Folks, that is not God honoring. We need to be people who are demonstrating the fact that God is real and God is in sovereign control and we love God. And how do we demonstrate that to the world? By keeping his commandments. Now, yes, we are saved by grace. Amen. None of us do it perfect. Amen. But my day-to-day -to -day life matters. That's why Jesus said it not once in Habakkuk 2, verse 4, but again in Romans, again in Galatians, again in Hebrews, the just shall live by faith. Not just put your faith in Christ, but the just shall live by faith. When people see your life, do they see you living in absolute faith in a sovereign God who is in full control and has a right to my life? That's what honors God. That's what glorifies God. That's why every time we come to this book, we better be prepared to reset. Not just once when we read the book. It was a good book. By the way, it's still a good book whether or not I reset or not. Amen? Because it was full of truth. Now listen. I want you to hear this. Jesus' life was not about comfort. Jesus' life was not about plaudits. It wasn't about a great job. It wasn't about a 401k. It was not about a, a boat, a, 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 an RV, a, a, a fishing trip, a, 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 the greatest buck that anyone ever saw, an, an elk tag. A, what, Jesus wasn't about that. He was about the kingdom. And what's so significant about that? I want you to turn to Psalm, two, Psalm uh, 119. We're going to study this. In prayer meeting. This is an incredible psalm. It, it's a prayer. It's a prayer. And every verse, absolutely every verse except 122, absolutely every verse in this psalm talks about the Word of God. They're called the commandments. They're called the law. They're called the statutes. They're called the judgments. They're called a number of different things. But every verse, imagine if you would, every verse of a prayer, 176 verses long, every verse refers to the Word of God. But it also refers to the God of the Word. Because it doesn't only say something about the Word. It talks about the Lord. But here's what I want you to see. Psalm 119. This is where we started. This is where we're going to finish. Blessed. You want to be blessed? Here's the formula. By the way, again, we said it. Blessed includes the word happy. When I know I'm blessed, I also know I'm happy and I'm content. But pay attention because he says, Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Can I say something to you? There is no other way to be blessed than to walk in the law of the Lord. It is proven in society that people who follow the mores of Scripture have a higher, uh, a higher uh, level of happiness in life. And it's not because they're obeying God. It's because God knew what he was talking about when he said, thou shalt not. God wants to bless us. But we can't be blessed apart from the word. He goes on to say, blessed are they that keep his testimonies, his witness. It's the Greek word, or the Hebrew word, edut, which means his testimonies, or, or his witness. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies, and that seek him with the whole heart. You know what the problem is today? We don't have a lot of wholehearted Christians. We have people that want to go to heaven... And so I'm going to say a prayer, I'm going to walk an aisle, I'm going to do whatever it takes to kind of get that ticket stamped. 
But my heart. <laughs> Listen, if God's got my whole heart, he'll have my worship. Not only on Sunday, he'll have it on Monday. He'll have it on Tuesday. He'll have it on Wednesday. He'll have it on Thursday. He'll have it on Friday. He'll have it on Saturday. He'll have my heart. And by the way, it'll affect my mouth because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So when people are around me, they'll hear my faith. It's not something I'll have to put on. They'll hear it because they're around me. By the way, some people won't want to hang around you anymore. We have a couple in our life years ago that, that we spent twice a week. We were with them twice a week forever and ever. And then Matthew was born. And when Matthew was born, that was a wake-up call for us. I looked at my firstborn, and I said to Mary, and Mary said to me, I forget who said it. She probably said it because she was quicker than I was on the draw. But one of us looked at each other and says, it's time to get serious about the Lord. And we looked at that little Matthew, and we said, you know what? It's time. Because you know what? I've got a kid to influence. And you know, when we got serious about the Lord, this couple walked away from us. They didn't want to spend time with us anymore. Now, folks, we didn't push them away. They just didn't want to spend time with us. Want to understand why that's true? Read Amos 3.3. 3. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Folks, if all of your best friends are unbelievers... There's probably something wrong. Now, I'm not saying don't spend time with unbelievers. Jesus spent time with unbelievers. But if all of your best friends are unbelievers, listen, Jesus' life was about kingdom work. It wasn't about fun and, and, and frolic and, and everything else. It was about kingdom work. And so when I respond to anything in my life that is negative, I need to ask, how does God get glory through this? Not woe is me, not what's in it for me. How does God get glory? And by the way, the ones that will see it quickest are my kids and my grandkids. Because I'll tell you what, whether you like it or not, parent, your kids know what you're all about. Now listen. Just listen. God said in the book of Exodus that none of his bones would be broken. Guess what? God said in Psalm 22 in Zechariah 12 that he would be on a cross and he would be pierced. And guess what happened? God said that they would cast lots for his garments in Psalm 22. And guess what happened? God said that he would be given vinegar to drink in Psalm 69. And guess what happened? God said that he would uh, cry out in pain. And guess what happened? God said that he would ascend into heaven. He would be raised from the dead. He would come on a colt uh, into Jerusalem, Zechariah chapter 9. He would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, Zechariah chapter 11. He would be deserted by his friends, Zechariah chapter 13. And over 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 again, God demonstrated to us who was in control at the cross and yet God allowed Christ to suffer why because it was his will it was his will and it wasn't his permissive will it was his sovereign will because Jesus was crucified, according to the book of Acts, before the foundation of the world. 
This wasn't some afterthought. One writer wrote it this way, the whole sweep and flow of the Old Testament and its types and symbols demanded that the Messiah, the Lord's anointed, die for the sins of the world that could never itself atone for those sins. The death of Christ has been called the scarlet thread of Scripture, the supreme truth around which all others are woven. I can remember reading one author, and I can't tell you who it was. I think it was McGee that said, when you read the Old Testament, if you do not see Christ, you are not reading the Old Testament with understanding. God didn't have one gospel in the Old Testament and a different gospel in the New Testament. And there's a, a, a rational, uh, there's a thinking out there that says that. Well, he was of the law in the old, but he was gracious in the New Testament. No, he was gracious in the Old Testament. Otherwise, Israel never would have made it. But what's the point of this whole thing? He rose. Now, what's the significance of that? I just want to show it to you real quick. You ready? We're going to fly. Look at Acts 2. Acts 2. And we're just going to read them. You'll have to study them later. Acts 2. Look, if you would, at verse 24. It says this, Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Do you realize, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the hold of death has been destroyed? You know what Paul said, absent from the body? Present with the Lord. The worst thing that can happen to me is not that I be killed today. The worst thing that can happen to me today is that I live another day. Because to be absent from the body is to be, and there's no way that's a bad thing. Amen? Look at Acts uh, chapter 17. Acts 17. Look, if you would, at verse 31. Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. Listen, you have an assurance of a time of judgment that is going to be a righteous judgment, the judgment of Christ. In other words, you can have assurance of God's incredible plan of salvation. If you're a blood-bought and born-again believer, you have the assurance that Jesus, when he was raised from the dead, was given the ability to not only be dead for his own uh, his own life, to his own life, but dead because of our trespasses and sins and made alive because God accepted it as a finished work. And I can be assured of my salvation. Look at Romans chapter 4, verse 25. Romans 4, verse 25. Who was delivered, he was crucified, for our offenses and when ra was raised again for our Justification. What's that mean? It does not mean just as if I'd never sinned. People say that all the time. That is not true. Justification is not God taking something away. That's called forgiveness. Justification is when God the Father adds to your account, adds to your account the righteousness of Christ so that your life is now justified. Wow. Wow. How did he do that? Through the resurrection. Through the resurrection. Now, we're not going to look at any more, but, but, but we're going to look at one more, Romans 6. <laughs> he says this, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should what? I want you to pay attention to that, friend. You know what the result of the resurrection should be in your life and my life? Our lives need to be different. Our lives need to be different. That we should walk in newness of life. 
that when someone looks at us, they don't see us going after the same stuff the world goes after. They see us going after the stuff that really counts for the kingdom. That all of a sudden my time is taken up by kingdom work. My talents are taken up by kingdom work. My resources are taken up by kingdom work. My, my, my desire is kingdom work. Why? There are thousands of people around us that need to see Christ. There's a coronavirus out there. Did you know it? Don't be afraid of it. Take precautions, yes. But you don't have to run around fearful of the, uh, of the coronavirus. Why? You're not leaving this planet till God's done with you, Amen. But we got a world out there scared to death of everything. God's not giving us a spirit of fear. You know what else it did? And I'm not going to read these to you. I'm going to tell you. Our lives should bring forth fruit unto God because of the resurrection. Romans 7. 1 Corinthians 15. Christianity rises and falls on the resurrection. Paul said, if that grave is not empty, we are, of all people, most miserable. <coughs> We're delivered, and I know that theologically not everyone believes this, but 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, we're delivered from the wrath to come because of the resurrection. Because he's already laid that wrath on my substitute. And folks, we need to live differently because of the resurrection. Here's the point. Every bit of this that God gave us in the book of Matthew was God's will. It was his will that Jesus would go to a cross. It was his will that Jesus would be mocked, that Jesus would be spit upon, that Jesus would, and it was Jesus' desire in all that to say, listen, I want to set you an example of the realization that whatever God allows in your life, he is absolutely just. Because he has a plan. All of it was God's will and God's plan. He's in control. Therefore, will we not fear? Do you live with the peace of God? Or are you living for the stuff of this world? Again, Jesus has already said it in the book of Matthew. No man can serve. He'll love one, hate the other. You can't serve two masters. If I'm not living for God, if, if my top priority is not the glory of God, I'll fall apart when I get bad words. I'll fall apart when I get bad news. I'll fall apart when I lose my job. I'll fall apart when I lose my health. I'll fall apart. But if I am truly living for God, I'll look at the realization that every bit of what, every one of my circumstances in God is in absolute full control of. Amen. And he wants to give us a life that is abundant. But the abundant life is in obedience to this book. Father, thank you for the truth of your holy word. Thank you for the example of Jesus. Thank you for the realization that nothing and no one can separate us from your love. There isn't a thing, there isn't a person, there isn't a circumstance that can separate us from the love that you have for us. God, thank you for the truth of that. Cause us to walk in that faith and to honor and glorify you, and we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. If you didn't